going to get the treasure in the wooden box treasure in the wooden box but we already have the jewelry and what a, what else a girl needs it's not about the gold and jewelry but it's about the ikes treasure of ikes treasure of ikes oh sounds different yes hurry home everyone we are we welcome you all this is our third and last day of this conference we have already seen many poster presentations conferences and wonderful sessions learn indian board games and so on now we are moving towards our next session for this we request a very dynamic and versatile personality professor b mahadevan ji he is the professor of production and operations management iim bangalore he was also the founding vice chancellor of cbb mahadevan sir has more than 27 years of wide ranging experience in teaching research consulting and academic administration he was also a he was also a trainer consultant in usa his research interest including researching the possibility of using ancient indian wisdom to address contemporary concerns spirituality in the workplace and management paradigm from bhagavad gita he has published many research papers and also the books if we if we start telling about him all his works then i will take next 2 3 hours and then also i am not sure if i can cover all his works rupal you remember when we came to cvv we were also introduced by yes. him about the ikes and sanskrit language we are very keen to listen you sir we welcome you sir we are highly delighted with your presence today we request you to please come upon the stage and throw the light on the topic treasure in the wooden box inspirational ideas from indic knowledge system mahadevan sir please thank you, thank you. Yes. आदो सर्वेभ्य नमस्कार राष्ट्रीय युवक सम्मेलन संगमन सम्मेलन किमी वक्त शक्म भारतीय ज्ञान परंपरा विषय अत्र आयोजित वर्तते चिन्मय विश्वविद्यालय त्र भाग स्वीकृत किंचि मम विश विषयान पिवेशयुकाश कल अके घंटी महोदया सर सी अन्या अविवी जना सुनीता महोदया अस्त अन्े अवती आद मम कृतज्ञता सामप्य किंचि ऐके विषय केचन विषयान पिवेशयुम्छा कैन यू स्विच ऑफ दिस लाइट मे बी दिस ऑल्सो दिस वन ना ना दिस शुड बी ओके ओके आई विल टेक अबाउट थर्टी फाइव फोर्टी मिनट्स मे बी थर्टी मिनट्स होपली समबडी वे वन से स्टॉप देन आई विल स्टॉप दैट्स ईजीएस्ट थिंग टू डू no but i think there is some amount of discussion also will be useful so when I, as many of you know this university also started with the idea of iks and to go a little bit and ask why we did that the genesis to that is people for the last 20 years people from different walks of life iks you know it's all researchers consultants you know well educated people well meaning well you know uh, read the people and so on and i got so many answers so many ways they have actually articulated what is indian knowledge system very quickly i'll put that and then move on if i ask what is it uh, many of them say it is mythology this myth word mythology baffles me myth is non existent ology is science so the science of non existence 
we very casually use many of these english words we should never use the word mythology we should only say puranas we should never because rama and krishna are not myth for us so we are using different uh, you know we have to be very careful while using english words i have now applied i have cleaned up a lot of my terminology now because i, I realize uh, it is going counter to my own understanding of things anyway religious prescriptions matters of blind faith I again tell them faith does not require an adjective blind faith by itself is blind that's a very definition of proof strictly unnecessary there is a definition for faith so you don't add blind and all that people anyway keep saying that if you ask where is it they say well it is all extinct uh, is there uh, incomprehensible too difficult to call out then i ask them why do we need it uh then they say uh, well it is useful for chanting mantras uh you know nowadays we use the word saffron agenda that's also convenient to use so they say saffron agenda okay uh mere unqualified glorification of the past no material gains one quite often people ask me will it provide two meals a day for the poor and i thumb the desk and say no because a 600 million satellite which isro puts on the orbit will not provide two meals a day directly but it will provide two meals a day indirectly you know it will predict weather and rainfall patterns better therefore our cropping pattern may be some such things will happen so indian knowledge system is exactly like that. i tell them no it will not because you read indian knowledge system dosas and idlis doesn't come to your dining table but indirectly it does that we have to go through that process and understand quality of life will become better we will become much more forthcoming in life we'll understand what is panchamaha agnyas and then we'll have a very sustainable society so many things can happen so will the society be any better of course all that only when we start but then what is really happening i think it's too fast what is really happening is uh, today we put iks to some standard use top of the list is abandon them we don't need to just abandon them Because you know it looks like uh, what is there, or uh, I'm sorry, this is too sensitive. Okay, or keep it in a puja room. Best thing is to keep Bhagavad Gita in the puja room every day. Uh, take it and change the flower. Never open and read. Ramayana keep it in the puja room. Mahabharat keep it in the puja room. The day you start. listening to all these lectures by grain sons and start reading it your life will transform forever but we don't seem to think about that possibility we think these are all holy you have to keep it somewhere okay or take positions without knowing anything about it go to the rooftop and say bhagavad gita is all useless religious and all that and i ask them do you have you read bhagavad gita then they say no i read uh, some one article on bhagavad gita then how are you making a statement like this but that has become a preoccupation or you can glorify the past some people say string theory is in bhagavad gita matta parataram na anyat kanchi kinchi jasti dananjaya mai sarvam itam protam sutre mani gana eva so that is a sutra word string so string theory is available in bhagavad gita so we are putting it to wrong uses knowingly unknowingly intentionally otherwise ideal thing to do is to get to know it first hand and explore new paradigms that is what india is waiting now and we have started and this is, momentum is picking up after some time nobody can stop it we are in the process of gaining momentum now well while this is what we all think let me now put a lot of things in front of you this is a temple about 50 kilometers from where i was born okay and uh, what happens is uh, this temple is built in 700 ce which is a good 1400 years back in a place called tirunelveli one of the biggest temples in the district okay and a cluster of 48 pillars carved from a single stone it is not you make 48 pillars and take a very quick and then stick them a single boulder is taken and i don't know how they created that gaps if you tap it you will get seven notes arigama pada nisa these are all musical pillars they are not uh, fancy pillars they are musical pillars okay so so many places in tamil nadu you have musical pillars madurai also has meenakshi temple they have now covered it because people are tapping it and it may get broken and all that number of people visiting madurai is some 
times number of people visiting this temple actually they are still today you can go and tap it if you want we will go and do a documentary there actually <laughs> 161 pillars in total that make the musical sounds. So seven notes are created. And the surrounding ones, uh, yeah, what is happening here? Vibrate when one of them is stopped, right? But when one of them is tapped, sound waves anyway travel now. So you actually will see the vibration in the, because they are all very close. You see the gaps, right? Now I want you to quickly think. I asked one person what, the, what it takes to do it. He said, sir, first of all, this is the hardest metal known to mankind, the hardest substance known to mankind, granite. If you have to chisel granite, you need ferrous carbon alloys. Otherwise, you cannot even chisel granite to the shape that you are talking about. So first, you should be good in ferrous carbon alloys, metallurgy, right? Then he said, of course, there is sound engineering involved here. You should know amplitude, frequency and those kinds of things, the thickness and the length, everything decides the sound. So he went on like that. He said, don't think this is a fancy thing. There's a whole lot of science and technology behind this. People would have seen this. This is a very popular thing in India, near Kutub Minar. Okay? But this is one of the 77. This is well known. So people see this. This is a 300 CE. If you go to Shingeri, from Shingeri, if you go to a place called Kollur, Mukambika Temple, I see one more iron pillar there. And it is just 35 kilometers from Arabian Sea. At least this is somewhere in the middle of the land. So one can say, see, see wind and all that, no corrosion. But you go and see the iron pillar in Mukambika temple, nothing happens to it. Okay? You have one at Dar, one at Mount Abu. Okay? You have 29 iron beams in Konark temple, which is on the seashore. You have about 239 pieces in Puri, Gundichibari temple. None of them have rested. And we are all talking of 1500 to 2000 years, 700 years. This is about 700 years. Orissa is about 700 years. So all these are saying that Indians were very good in, all these are ferrous carbon alloys. You know, I, am a, I am a mechanical engineer. If I don't read what is called temperature time transformation diagram, I would not have passed mechanical engineering. As time goes at different temperatures, what happens to the ferrous and carbon? That's why steel and all those, this is an important subject for us. Without knowing it, you can't do any of this. As late as 1963, they have not been replicate. I read in one of the international conference proceedings, there's something called wood steel. They are not able to replicate the composition even today. Wood steel was exported from here around this place. There is one Kodungalur port. That time trade, if you have to go on this side, Kodungalur port, if you go to the Far East, you have to go to Pumbuhar. These are the two vibrant ports. Both of them are non-existent today. They were exporting wood steel from here to manufacture what is called Damascus blades, swords for warfare. They were all sent from here. That's the situation at that time. I don't know whether people know what it is. This is the only surviving dam in the world of the five oldest. This is, in terms of uh, seniority order, this is the fourth. There were three which was ahead of them. They are no more. The one after this is also no more, 2000 years old. This is in a place called Trichy, Kallanai. This is called Grand Anaikat. Karikalan built it. And uh, 100 and years, 150 years back, Britishers just added two more layers to just increase the height. That's all they did. This is a living dam oldest living dam in the world okay others are all gone and i invited somebody md shinivas two days to iam bangalore and he get here was delivering a talk and he talked about how watershed management was absolutely fantastic he quoted from tamil Nadu. these are tamil Nadu examples i can give you watershed management in rajasthan pakistan western india i can talk about iron and pine system in bihar we had a very good understanding of watershed management so this is an example of that. During Sangam period, which was uh, 300 uh, BCE to 300 CE, southern parts of India, we had Grand Anaikat. In 1804, the Britishers raised the height of the dam by about 27 inches and so on. So we were good in watershed management, which was very, very important. This is again the temple which is in doldrums today. It's a destroyed temple. It's not a living temple. 
the invading Dutch came and just destroyed it because they thought there is some piece which is a magnet or something they wanted. That's what I'm not very sure about that. I've been reading it. I'm not very sure. I believe the whole structure, the idol was supported with a magnet, big magnet on the top. The moment they removed it, the whole system collapsed. But then this temple has so many interesting things. 13th century. So we are talking about uh, 800 years at least. And it again, 12 years to complete. Sun idol was suspended using magnets. That's what reports say. It's still uncomfortable. I'm not able to say that. But the interesting thing about this temple, the first ray of the sun, when the sun rises, will fall on the idol every day. That means you have to be very good in astronomy because there is this Uttarayana, Dakshinayana, movement of sun. So you need to now create a mechanism so that the first ray always falls on the sun's idol. And all these are actually sun dials. You can see the it's a clock. Depending upon the shadow, you can actually understand. So they were good in astronomy. They were really good in astronomy. Otherwise, how can you do all that? You can't do all this by some, uh, you know, uh, Maya Jal and all that. You need the proper science. Otherwise, you can't even do all this. I don't know whether people have seen this. Anyway. These are, you know, you read news about this every day, either being smuggled or brought back. That's the only news we are reading now. Either these idols have been brought back from Australia and the US and all that, or they are smuggled out of India. These idols are all made Chola time. You go to Swami Malay. I'm sure you would have seen it last time. You go to Swami Malay near Kumbakonam, you will find people doing it even today. And only in 17th century, they understood how to do it. This, uh, you know, last wax casting process. Whereas in Vishnu Dharmotra Purana, it is written, Madhu, Ch Madhu Chishta Vidana. Uchishta is left out. Madhu is B, you know, so beehive, basically the wax. With that, they make precise uh, shapes of uh, this cast. Then they pour the metal. We also do Panchaloha idols, which means we can work with the five metals, a combination of five metals, and we can make these. So Indians were absolutely fabulous when it came to metal working technology. Britishers completely destroyed it by 1900 through several methods. They destroyed it because they wanted to take, they put a, a ban on uh, mining, they put a production tax, everything, so that you can't do anything. You have to take it and then send it to UK, process it, bring it back, value add, and then sell it here and make all of us poor. In fact, it is the Mughals and the Britishers who made Indians poor. The Jesia tax, the Mughals excessively taxed this country for 200 years. And uh, Britishers did everything in the wrong way. They took the raw material from here, converted it into finished goods, brought it back and sold it and then made money and they just destroyed a very good fabric that was part of this country actually. So what is IKS? So I've given you just a few examples. So let me formally define IKS. There are three terms here, Indian knowledge and system. So let me define all the three. The first definition is Indian. So it is basically a simple definition is indigenous source of knowledge, which is fine. But I will make two important uh, qualifications to the word Indian. There's a geographical qualification. There is a demographical qualification. Geographical qualification is Indian means not just this 19, post 1947 India. That's all some you know, mischief done in the last 75 years. India means Akhanda Bharat. It starts from Afghanistan on the you know, uh, west to Burma and a little bit of the island on the east. East to west was quite large. North south was always tight. You had the ocean on one side, you had Himalaya. That's why even Vishnu Purana, the definition is very tight because you have Himalayas on one side and uh, ocean on the other side. Whereas east west was very sprawling. So that is the geographical definition of Indian, not uh, government of India 1947 and all that. Then there is a demographic definition, which is very, very important. In fact, this was my first realization when I started writing this book. I started reading a lot of uh, Indological texts and I found they were actually not appropriate. So uh, the Western scholars, what they have written about Indian, I don't call it as IKS, I call it as about IKS. You know, I'm not even attributing an agenda, all that I'm not interested in talking now. But, so the qualification to be Indian demographically is somebody who is born here, lived here, 
through this culture and then observed and then wrote commentaries and so on. Or somebody who has come here spent so much time. For example, there was a lady by name Stella Krimrish. She came in 1920 to the University of Calcutta. 20 years she spent. Absolutely fantastic book on Hindu temples. I don't think you can read any other book better than that. Because she was immersed into this culture. She got an understanding of what uh, this culture is. Then she wrote. She wrote a book on uh, Vishnu Dharmotra Purana. Commentary on Vishnu Dharmotra Purana. I mean, commentary in the sense, she, I found they are all good. Most of the books, when I started reading, I realized I cannot rely on them. I just put them all aside and started going into, you know, the original texts in Sanskrit and the Indian commentaries and all that kind of a thing. So, travelers accounts, translation by non-Indians are all about IKS and not IKS at all. I want you to understand that. Then comes knowledge. Knowledge, of course, is that which emanates uh, out of uh, experimentation, validation. That's how knowledge comes. Observation, keen observation, gaining experience. So every society gets knowledge like that. Indians also got knowledge like that. The only thing I want to say is the Indian knowledge is into two compartments. One compartment I called as formal literary, another is informal oral. Informal in the sense that you don't need a lippy, you don't need a script. Grandmother's ideas of how to treat uh, a particular ailment is an informal oral tradition, rich oral tradition is there. Whereas there are formal, which can also be oral, the entire Vedic the, this culture was oral, but it was formal. Scripts were there, lippies and all that kind of thing. So that's one. Second thing that we need to know about Indian knowledge is every piece of knowledge has beautifully three dimensions, spiritual, philosophical, uh, spiritual, religious and you know, day-to-day, -day, secular or whatever you want to call. In, when, I, when I teach Bhagavad Gita and I am Bangalore as a three credit elective, I show them the three dimensions throughout the course. So they see that this is three-dimensional. I mean, it's a oral tradition. You can't write one book for uh, philosophy, one book for, uh, you can't write everything in one book. It's up to you to, you know, decipher it out. Okay, Aryabhata will have a lot of philosophy and mathematics. If you know how to read it, you will understand it. So that's the culture. So it's a three-dimensional uh, this thing. Then, of course, you have what is called system, which is a very structured methodology by which you can classify the entire corpus in a mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive kind of a way. And there are some good methods available. If you take the Sanatana Dharma, that can be classified using what is called Chaturdasha Vidyasthan. But there are other methods available. So I will show you the method I adopted while we wrote the book. Okay. So IKS as literary and non-literary, those are the two broad sort of things. Sanatan Dharma, other dharmic traditions and regional comes under literary. And of course, there is a rich oral tradition. And in the core Sanatan Dharma, you have Veda, Vedanga, you know, Dharma Shastras, Itihasa, Purana, Darshanas, basic, our existential corpus. So that Chaturdasha Vidyasthana, several people have commented, added on the top of it, etc, etc. But very little people know that Sanatan Dharma literature has phenomenal amount of science technology that you want. It is not in small measure. You have basic and applied sciences, engineering, technology, alchemy, architecture, aesthetics, health, wellness, public administration, everything. In our book is only dealing the right side. We Very little we have done. About 30 pages we have done on these out of 450 pages. The remaining 400 pages are on the right side. Because this is a big misnomer. People don't understand Indian knowledge system. Otherwise, how do you get those temples and all those uh, musical pillars and so on? How do you get it? You don't get it without knowledge of it. That's why this is very rich. In the other Dharmic traditions, you have a, a Bauda and Jaina. In addition to their Siddhanta, their basic religious tenet, Buddhist works have mathematics, shipbuilding. Jaina works have a lot of mathematics. You have Mahavira Acharya in the 8th century, you have done, contributed well. In 2600 years back, there are Jainist texts, Jain texts in which they have estimated the number of living species in the world to be 2 power 96. So they know thirds and powers and all that at that time itself. Root 2, they could give, uh, you know, irrational numbers. Pi, root 2. So Jain also has a lot of mathematical works. Of course, the regional text is in some sense just doing the Sanatan Dharma 
but with the local improvisation local example is much easier sometimes in telugu tamil malayalam and all that it's a voluminous corpus which will be a mirror of this but written in the local for example kerala school of mathematics has phenomenal amount of work done which are in sanskrit and in malayalam so like that so we have uh, all these of course we have a very good oral tradition which is uh, art forms health food this is the only country you take a car travel on the road every 40 kilometers your taste on the tongue will change because that much variety we have in terms of food and practices and so on same dosa will look very different we have a dosa camp in bangalore is 100 different dosas they make you know so that's the power of this country we are very rich all local traditions actually so this is how the corpus is just to sprinkle a tip of the iceberg 3000 bc to 500 ce is uh, just i sprinkled a few i you may ask me why did you choose 3000 bc to 500 ce in the western para, uh, scheme of things this is called dark ages it is already very bright in india it's called dark ages there if you go and see there is a way they have medieval and then pre modern there is a methodology they have come up with this is called dark ages so this is what you have in dark ages in this country it's a sample okay you have you know mathematics public administration if you want uh, prosody binary math chandra shastra you will find uh, you know uh, all your algorithms required for binary math pascal triangle meru prastara everything is there written in 300 200 bc but i taught all of them to iimb students this year they all were very happy you know i taught them binary math and all that from my book and uh, that kind of things you have finance foreign policy Arthur Shastra is amazing. More and more I read, I am finding it absolutely fabulous. The level of detail that Kautilya has given is unimaginable. Actually, I have been reading and reading and lecturing on that nowadays. Okay, so anyway, so you have linguistics, lexicography, astronomy, Surya Siddhanta used by whole of North India for Panchanga. This is their reference. Whereas South India uses Arya Bhatia. They use uh, uh, that Siddhanta. They use North India uses Surya Siddhanta. we have the pancha siddhantika anyway this is from 500 ce to 1800 ce uh, a series of work on astronomy mathematics architecture town planning see bhopal is not bhopal it is actually bhojpal king rajboj built that and he wrote a beautiful book called samarangana sutra dara it was pleasure to read it actually some uh, 182 chapters Maybe some four thousand shlokas or something. It's beautiful to read. He built Bhopal. That's why it is Bhopal. Now it has become Bhopal. One day they will make it Bhopal again. Anyway, so you have a lot of those uh, kind of uh, you know uh, things uh, that we have done. Iconography, very good. In fact, uh, in um, I think Varaha Mehra's Brihas Samhita, because I read it in Samarangana Sutra Dara that every idol that iconography in India. follows there are five humanoids specified by varaha mihra for male and female five patterns for example each pattern is what is the ratio of uh, you know breadth to length of the head or length to the upper part or proportions the entire iconography uses only that i was wondering why ready made manufacturers are not reading it job is simple you have to actually read all those uh, proportional measurements and you can ready made industry can benefit our indian iconography has always used that's why our idols look so beautiful it's there in varaha mehra's brihas samhita for example we don't know any of those little more i'll peep into it because there are a lot of youngsters i want to throw more of this uh, uh, you know masalas in front of you so that you can start digging it up in your own ways yes i showed it to a metallurgist i said what do you infer from this this is a mauryan seal samudra gupta 300 ce he said sir you know what all things involved in that first you should know how to identify an ore related to gold you have to do ore extraction and ore mining you have to do the metal separation then you have to do what is called casting embossing forming he gave all that i knew in metallurgy to make that seal finally he said this is not easy there are so many processes involved in making this seal 300 ce that is an ornament in andhra royal rings first century bce kept in some museum again he said how can you make this 
you need very intricate tools to work on metal forming techniques. That's what he told me when I showed it. You just comment on what, what, what do you think about it? You are a subject matter expert. This is what he told me, actually. Indians were absolute, Indi only Indians knew how to extract zinc. The rest of the world did not know. The reason was zinc, when you take the ore, zinc ore and then heat it up, all metals are extracted by heating only because then the metal separates from the impurities and that kind of a thing. But what happens is zinc becomes vapor at 500 degrees centigrade. At 600 degrees centigrade, it becomes zinc oxide. So you need to do something between 500 and 600, otherwise you can't get zinc. Indians did it. Downward drift distillation process, which 300 years back was. So they, that's a rough yantra for it. They put something and then they cool it, and then they put one pipe and something like that. The metal liquefies and then they collect it. By 11th century CE, Indian production of zinc was industrial grade, running to million tons. Whereas the West did not know zinc. They didn't know how to extract. That was the situation. And you should read, there are good material. Hindustan Zinc Limited has actually done a good amount of work with the University of Baroda and a few researchers have brought out some half a dozen, one dozen papers in the last 20 years and so on. They have done K3 mines in Rajasthan. Rajasthan is where a lot of these open mines, they have studied the process. So many things have happened about zinc. Wood steel, as I told you, is used for Damascus blades. It's called woods because this is manufactured in a place not too far from here. It is at the junction of Tamil Nadu, Karnataka and Kerala, that area, Salem and that area. So in Tamil it is called Uruku. In Kannada it is called Uku. Therefore woods, you know, it's sometimes difficult to pronounce so it gets, that's why it is called wood steel and it was manufactured and exported to Damascus to make that. Now, wood steels they are not able to replicate. That's what I read. One of the while I was writing the book, I was also extensively reading to find out what is happening and so on. In one of the 1963 conference, they said they could not reproduce yet the composition of wood steel. This is a square. This I used to teach here when I used to offer IKS. I used to teach this Bauda and Silva Sutra to the students. That how do you use only a stick? and a thread. That's all Indians use. You mount a stick and a thread, you can only generate a circular arc, nothing else you can do. It's called Sulba Sutra. Sulba is thread. So in Vedanga, one of the Vedanga called Kalpa, you have mechanisms for uh, making those chitis, vedis, the altars. So they need to make different shapes. There are 77 different altars. If you want to know some of them, go to a place called, uh, you know, in Pune, there is one small museum in which they have kept all that. Where the Samshodhana Mandala, you just go and see, they have kept some of the chitis there, uh, they have still preserved a little bit of that in scale models and so on. You should actually look at some of them, it's a very, they have done a little bit of... Uh... So this is a construction for square, simply using circle. This is called cyclic geometry, this is exactly called cyclic geometry. You only use arts and generate any shape you want. That's what Indians are doing. Okay, so this is called, uh, there is a shloka in Bodha and Sulpa Sutra which, using which this was done. I am not getting into the shlokas and so on. This is taught as rope geometry in several uh, western universities, British Columbia, somewhere in Pennsylvania, I saw rope geometry, Sulpa Sutra. Uh, I was sometime back, I was seeing their course outlines and some notes and all that kind of things. We don't teach any of this in this country because we don't know. We don't know such a thing even exists. That is the plight of Indians. So this is the Sena Chiti, the falcon, flying falcon. There is one available in Uttarakhand which is 2400 years old in a delipated condition, it is still there. So this is not easy. You have to make it exactly with 200 bricks, not one more and not one less. And the bricks are of five different shapes, B1, B2, B3, B4, B5. You add up all of them, it becomes 200. So you have to generate this using cyclic geometry now. Trapezium, isosceles triangle, rhombus, everything you can generate. This is called cyclic geometry. That's why, you know, we were very good in that. And we could do this. These are all called Defontine equations. Third century BC, they propose 
equation they don't know how to find. These are very difficult problems to solve. Ax plus by equal to c, two unknowns, two coefficients and one constant. How do you get a solution? Integer solution. You can get any kind of solution. You can just put y equal to 3 and then put a some number, b some number and come with the x which may be a real, some 5.32. Question is two integers I need. x and y should be integers. To solve this, these are all extremely, and second degree, w cube plus x cube is equal to y cube plus, that's called a famous Ramanujam number. He got into a taxi and said he solves this Diffontein equation. 1729 will solve this problem. w cube plus x cube equal to y cube plus z cube. That, those are the numbers, 12, 1, 9, and 10. Ramanujam was God, incarnated, max as math. He got into a car and said this is a solution for Diffontein equation of third degree. Okay, Indians solved it. Aryabhata gave a beautiful method called Kuttaka method, with which they, he solved the Defontein equation, linear indeterminate equation. This is called Pell's equation. Pell did not solve. Brahmagupta solved this uh, W cube plus X cube. Uh, you know, this X square minus N Y square is equal plus R something that he solved. Brahmagupta solved it in seventh century, but now we call it as Pell's equation. Okay, so this is what it is. Aryabhata solved it. Brahmabuddha solved this equation, okay, and these were French mathematicians, much later they started actually you know, studying, we are all, we are, if you read BSc, MSc, Max, they will tell you Pierre D. Format found this De Fontaine equation, we have it in Brahmagupta, but MDS came and described it in some detail to his students actually, okay, and Bhaskaracharya, uh, Paskara 2, modified version of Brahmagupta got some integer. Integer value is the problem. Real values you can find. What is a, f and they gave a, not one solution. They gave a methodology by which you can keep on finding more and more integer solutions. You can keep on, you know, it's like least common divisor. After that, you can go on. That kind of methodology Indians did. Different tiny equations. This is a very beautiful thing called magic square. I do not know how many of you are aware of magic square. See, if you take things on the left, add all rows will add up to 34, add all columns it will add up to 34, add the true primary diagonals will add up to 34. This is called magic square. It's called Badra Ganita. I'll tell you why it is called Badra Ganita later in India. That is called pan diagonal magic square. That, don't think of it like a sheet. Think of it as a cylinder. Taurus. So what happens after 13, 6, 4, the next number will be here because like this, no? So this will be the diagonal now. So there are any number of diagonals now, not the one diagonal. That also is 34 now. You just see that number. See 13 plus 6, 29 plus 4, 33 plus 1, 34. Let us look at this. This, this and this. The next number will be that because now you have to roll the torus horizontally, not vertically. You can roll the torus horizontally. So, this, 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 this number will be that fellow. That will also add up to 34 now. That's quite a tough problem. It is called pan diagonal magic square. This is magic square. This pan, this has plenty of industrial application. Don't think this is fun. It has management applications. I keep telling my students. It's called Badra Ganita. That is called Sarvato Badra Ganita. Why is it called Badra Ganita? You go, you go to some villages and some places, you will find casually on the wall, they would have a magic square for 70 or 90. Because the belief was if the magic number is 90, you know, wealth will improve, child will be born. So it was a, it's a casual thing for them to create magic squares. It is there. If you go deep into the villages, you will find. That's why it's called Badra Ganita, Badram Bhavati. It is a summation, it is 70 Bhavati, Badram Bhavati. Tasmat it is Badra Ganita Habut. In Sarvato Badra Ganita, which means whichever form it is the same. We have Naharjuna, a Buddhist monk, solved this with a beautiful equation using Katapayati in the first century BC. And to the Kerala School of Max in 1400, he solved that with a beautiful algorithm called Turagagati, like hearts going. And he said only 383 possibilities are there. 1923, they said only 12 possibilities. In 1928, finally, they said 383 possibilities. They proved what he said 600 years later. Narayana Pandita has done a lot of work. Ramanujam's first book has magic squares. So don't, uh, you know, we don't know the Hanuman in us, actually, <laughs> so to speak. 
So what happened? Why I, mean, I can keep on going? My book has lots of these details. You can buy and read it. For want of time, I have just sprinkled a little bit here, here and there. Full of this material we have in our in our book. Actually, you can look at it. So question is, what happened to IKS? Well, there is compelling evidence. This book is based on three evidences. It's not written simply. The book was written on three evidences. First, literary evidence. We went to Rasaratna Samuchaya. We went to Samarangana Sutra Dara or whatever you want, you know, Brihat Samhita, Panchasiddhantika. We tried to actually use literary evidence. Second, there is pouring archaeological evidence today. They have completely destroyed the Aryan invasion theory thanks to archaeological evidences. Max Muller said that Vedic time is 1200. From 600, he added 200, 200, 200, it came to 1200. But then there are about 77 references for Saraswati and Rigveda. Saraswati river dried up in 1900 BC. Today we have established it so well using archaeology and other methodologies. So the whole thing is gone. So the second evidence we use is archaeological evidence. The third evidence we use is living structures. This is the only country in which things are living for 2000 years. The dam is living. The big temple is living. Everything is living. Nothing is dead. <laughs> There are some temple we went in the documentary with Puja, there was Pradosha Puja happening when we were shooting actually. It was a Pradosha day, so we stopped it. I also chanted Rudra, went with them for a while and then continued the shooting. These are living evidence. So we use those three evidence. So there is compelling evidence, but we have no inkling of this today. Absolutely no inkling of this today. We have little awareness of any of these. We do not see teaching any of these in any education. That's why we wanted to start in a small way here. We should bring it out, right? And whatever we have today are all branded as what is called Adivasi. You go 100 kilometers from here, there is a place called Aranmulla. Just go and see. They will give you a mirror. Go and buy that mirror. It is pure metal. It is not mirror. It is a pure metal. And that trade, I don't know how long it is going to go. They will call it as Adivasi. The best technologies are now marginalized. Our native technology is brand rebranded as Adivasi. What more you want? This is not the way to do. So that's what we do. We call them a scheduled caste and scheduled caste. Nothing here. They were the main knowledge creators of this country. You use a different paradigm and then re semantically change things. This time we have to get back and see what is going on. So large parts, and why did it happen? Large parts of this India were subjected to foreign rule for more than 700 years. From 1200, when the Nalanda was destroyed, 12 universities were destroyed in and around Nalanda in a matter of three months. There is one very famous uh, Hollywood, uh, Bollywood star, his son's name is Taimur. Taimur said, I, I am very happy I killed 1000 people a day. So that is the kind of legacy we have lived. Nobody tells about it. you have to dig up and read actually these things. Okay. So large scale burning, no civilization can weather such catastrophic damages created. Still we have survived. That's the, that is, lies the hope. Don't give up hope. With all that we have survived, it's just a matter of time. Things will come out. We, all that we need is youngsters like you in another next 30, 40 years. We will just change. That's all we need. We don't need uh, to worry about anything. Okay, priorities of what needs to be encouraged and what manner was entirely left to the ruling class. In the last 20 years, every young boy in this country wants to read some engineering and then go and sit in front of a computer and do tuck, 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 tuck with a keyboard. Why? Because that is what we are pushing. So the ruling class and the economic priorities will shift you one from one to the other. Macaulay did that. And he said, get lost. If you come there, I will give you food. Here you will starve to death. I don't want to die. First, I want to have three meals. So I will abandon this and go there. So the ruling class can do it. The British Raj did all that. They decided which skill they need, which skill they have to dispose of. That's what they did. And the society, you know, you and I are ordinary people at the end of the day. We need first survive and have food. So although we may have it close to your heart, there is a reality. I have a child. I have, you know, sort of, uh, that's how it started moving. So, little bit, this minutes you should read and contemplate. So, minutes which is informed of why we are in a complete mess in education today. You should read this Macaulay's minutes and understand it. I've just pulled a few sentences which I thought I will bring it to you. Dialects commonly spoken among the natives of this part of India can neither 
literary scientific information so poor and rude this is the job of the europeans they have to go to another country you know red indians or australians they have to clean them up first as though they are all good for nothing only i know everything others don't know anything this fixation has created so much of upheaval in this global order so they want to do it here also so you have to now enrich them from some other quarters because the question that asked was 1 million pounds should i spend on uh, bot language is it so he, amakale starts by saying it can be english arabic or sanskrit finally he says it is english and then he says indians themselves don't feel good about what they are about all that he wrote in that minutes actually single shelf of a good european library worth the whole native literature of india and arabia it's also part of that uh, minutes i believe no exaggeration to say all the historical information which has been collected from all the books written in sanskrit language is less valuable than what may be found in most paltry abridgments used at preparatory schools this is a challenge to all of you you have to take this challenge you have to prove that this is wrong no matter what you do every one of you must read one sanskrit book and say it is better than what i have read we should do it this university must push it very hard on you actually and what did mahatma gandhi say mahatma gandhi said i say without fear of my figures being challenged successfully today india is more illiterate than what it was 100 exactly 100 years after makale started 1832 he is saying in 1931 okay why because they came to india instead of taking hold of things they began to root them out okay scratch the soil began to look at the root and left the root just like that the beautiful tree perish he, he referred beautiful tree as the indian education system dharampal's book this is in dharampal's book okay statistics left by british administrators which show that uh, well all the ancient schools have gone by the board no recognition for these schools schools established after the european pattern were too expensive today it is too expensive an english medium school is 10 times expensive than a malayalam medium school in kerala an english medium school is 10 times expensive than a tamil medium school in tamil nadu even after 200 years we are in the same mess this is what they have left with us gandhi what said in 1931 is true in 2031 i let me tell you i was in you know a place called manjakudi for three day two for a day i was there teaching iks for some 700 students actually so there i found there is a tamil medium school english medium school if i have done some work for them some time back also that's why they call me it's all expensive so how can you teach indian things you can't so things are changing i am telling you we have waited enough now after 75 years we have decided to turn and we have got a center for professor ganti murthy and his team of people here also anuradha is also there there are so many people here who are all part of this and as as a part of this exercise this book also came out acit really requested me and then you know we this idea in a way started in this university uh, you know the idea of iks although the book is moved to engineering so many things we did because that was a audience we had to do at that uh, you know when we thought about but it is a first of its kind because there are no such books unfortunately it was surprising after 75 years we don't have a book which can tell you in a slightly easier way about what is iks it looks like somebody had to do it and we were sort of uh, you know able to do it all these what i quoted are all part of that book so i'll come to the wooden box now so you asked uh, you may be wondering what is this wooden box business so i want to narrate a story and leave it there was a temple and uh, as we saw see in many temples uh, sometimes beggars sit and ask for some uh, uh, you know this thing so a beggar was asking for arms when sanyasi was about to enter into the temple he asked for arms sanyasi said i am also supposed to beg like you because that is my ashrama dharma i can't really give you anything but then the sanyasi told him you are sitting on a wooden box uh, why don't you open and see what is there uh, and then he went in whereas the beggar immediately replied sir i am a fourth generation my great grandfather was a beggar my grandfather was a beggar my father was a beggar i am also a beggar we were all sitting only on the same wooden box what is there then sanyasi told whether you sit on the wooden box for 1 hour or 1 million hour until you open and see what is inside you may not know what is it and then he went away this last statement started churning this beggar after 4 5 days he thought maybe there is some truth in what this sanyasi said there was an old lock he took a big boulder of stone and then broke the lock 
He opened it. It was full of jewels. So you are sitting on a box of jewels and begging. It's not the story of the beggar. It's the story of us. We are sitting on a wooden box with a lot of treasure inside. We are begging for knowledge from elsewhere. So we need to choose what to do. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Just wow, wow, and wow. What a session. We are just short of words. How to thank sir for this amazing session. When he speaks, we can feel how passionate he is about IKS. With his inspiration, I wish to say a few lines about IKS here. Jyotish Shastra ke mihir sada aur shalya chikitsa shushrut ki liye gadit hai Brahm Gupta Yoga Praneta Rishi Patanjali. Acharya Chadak ne Ayurved Viman Vidya Rishi Bharadwaj रसायन विज्ञान के नागार्जुन अर्थशास्त्र चाणक्याचार्य आर्यभट्ट भास्कराचार्य और कितने ही जन्मे हैं यहाँ शिक्षा की पद्धति पर दृष्टि करें तक्षशिला और नालंदा बात करें फिर लौह स्तंभ दिल्ली को लूर कर्नाटका ऑल दिस वॉज समराइज बाय हिम इन अ वेरी शॉर्ट टाइम दिस वॉज द परफेक्ट सेशन टू ट्रिगर अवर फीलिंग्स अबाउट आई के एस ऑन वेरी लास्ट डे थैंक यू सो मच सर वंस अगेन वंस अ बेग राउंड ऑफ अप्लॉज फॉर हिम Thank you so much, sir. Now we will uh, request Dr. Anuradha Chaudhary ji to please have the stage. Anuradha ji, she is an assistant professor, Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Kharagpur, and coordinator IKS division at AICTE. Anuradha ma'am is a highly motivated Sanskrit scholar dedicated to revealing the deeper secret of Vedas and promoting Sanskrit as a living, modern and spoken language. She has completed her PhD in Sanskrit on Vedic psychology where she presented practical application of this new kind of psychology in our daily lives. She travels widely to teach Sanskrit and yoga psychology. She is with us for three days. Simple living in high thinking is a perfect quote for her. We welcome you, ma'am. Please enlighten us on the topic, the secret of secrets, the IKS way. Anuradha, ma'am, a big round of applause for her. Hello. Can I have that on top, please? Can I have the board on top here somewhere? Yes, indeed. This side might be easier. Okay, this side. Thank you very much. This is good. Uh -huh. No, I think you put it that way. <laughs> Thank you very much. Maybe just out a little bit. I hope it's not covering the photo. The photo is not covered. Namaste, Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha, Sabhasad Bhyo Namaha. Atra Upasite Bhyaha, Shreshte Bhyaha, Jeshte Bhyaha, Mitre Bhyaha, Mamasadra Pranamaha. As we do in our tradition, I'd like to start with an invocation. Om Shanno Mitra Shamvarunaha Shanno Bhavatvaryama, Shanna Indro Brihaspatihi, Shanno Vishnu Rurukramaha, Namo Brahmane, Namaste Vayu, Twameva Pratyaksham Brahmasi, Twameva Pratyaksham Brahma Vadisha, Vritam Vadishyami, Satyam Vadishyami, Tanmāmavatu, tadvaktāramavatu, 
ಅವತುಮಾಂ ಅವತು ವಕ್ತಾರಂ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಐ ವುಡ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಟು ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಬೈ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ರೆಸಿಂಗ್ ಮೈ ಹಾರ್ಟ್ ಫೆಲ್ಡ್ ಗ್ರಾಟಿಟ್ಯೂಡ್ ಟು ದ ಚಿನ್ಮಯ ಮಿಷನ್ ಟು ಟು ದ ಚಿನ್ಮಯ ವಿಶ್ವವಿದ್ಯಾಪೀಠ ಆಲ್ ದಿ ಆರ್ಗನೈಸರ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದಟ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟಿಟ್ಯೂಷನ್ ಫಾರ್ ಹ್ಯಾವಿಂಗ್ ಗಿವನ್ ಮೀ ದಿಸ್ ಇನ್ಕ್ರೆಡಬಲ್ ಪ್ರಿವಿಲೇಜ್ ಸುನೀತಾ ಜಿ ಸ್ಟ್ಯಾಂಡಿಂಗ್ ದೇರ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ವೆರಿ ಮಚ್ ಫಾರ್ ಗಿವಿಂಗ್ ಮೀ ದಿಸ್ ಆಪರ್ಚುನಿಟಿ ಆಫ್ ಬೀಂಗ್ ಪ್ರೆಸೆಂಟ್ ಇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಆಗಸ್ಟ್ ಮಿಲಿಯರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದಿಸ್ ಆಬ್ಸೊಲ್ಯೂಟ್ಲಿ ವೆರಿ ಸೇಕ್ರೆಡ್ ಭೂಮಿ of shankaracharya's birth place i i consider it an absolute honor also to be standing here and talking to you because i am standing on the shoulder of several stalwarts who have spoken before me and the the just most recent one being professor mahadevan and these are some of the best people that i have met in my life i have traveled far and wide but i can tell you that these are some of the people whom i regard extremely highly who have uh, mentored us and who are the torch bearers for the new civilizational uprising that is happening today the new renaissance that we are extremely fortunate to be part of so uh, there have been many other wonderful speakers i also am always grateful to my my boss uh, professor ganti murthy ji who's uh, always encouraging us to uh, to d- discover our own best and to try and promote that wherever we go so many speakers thank you very much for this opportunity again i would like to try and adopt the upanishadic method the upadeshik upanishadic pedagogy to try and present what i am saying here so one of the things that the upanishad does is that it makes it used to have its sessions in an interactive manner so teaching was always interactive there's a lot of deep neuroscience behind uh, these methods that were adopted in the upanishads so when you have interactive listening but you're actively engaging your prefrontal cortex of reasoning and you know you exercise your gray matter in the process of learning the second one is that it used a lot of metaphors so they say one image speaks a thousand words so the language was always metaphorical so you looking at one thing i mean i share an image with you and simultaneously the mind is filled with many other possibilities around that image so i'll be trying to use images in the presentation that i have for you and the th- as in i'll be creating these images and we drawing some but yeah and the third one is that the language of the upanishads was always very symbolic because it was about understanding that you have re- uh, representations at one level but they could actually imply many other things at many levels so looking at uh, visuals but understanding their psychological symbolism as well so i'll be trying to use these ways in uh, and present what i have to say to you today so the uh, topic that i have before you was also inspired by because when sunita ji said please give us a topic i said now what do you give for a topic <laughs> so when she mentioned about uh, mahadevan ji's talk on the hidden box i said it has to have a, a matching uh, mystery about it <laughs> so the word that popped up because i've been working with the vedas a little bit and also the gita so the with the vedas it is this idea of the you know ninyani vachansi so there are these rahasyam kuhyam and in the gita in the end also shri krishna says na guhyat guhyataram so there is this secret of secrets so i said okay let's call it the secret of secrets the iks way uh um, but i would like to because i said i'll make it interactive when you hear the term secret of secret the iks way what might you think it is all about what do you think this is really what what do you think i'm going to be talking to you about anybody i'll just take three guesses sorry that also is a secret not for too long hopefully <laughs> so what do you think the secret of secrets could deal with any three guesses very quickly something and i guess that you don't know all right hidden knowledge is in vedas and puranas okay methodology so the way in which education was imparted okay 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 so i will like i said i'll start with a with an analogy itself so imagine that there is a car that comes and stops in front of you 
um, you don't you know nothing about that car you don't know about its make you don't know uh, you know you don't know how fast it can go you don't know where it is going to go you don't know who the driver is you don't know how much fuel there is you know nothing about that car it might look like a good car but you know don't really know whether it is as good as it looks so you have a car that comes and stops in front of you how many of you will enter that car you know nothing about it how many of you will get into it curious but you don't know it might be heading straight to the cliff or it might move at such a pace that you know all your time you will just go on tick and it might look as if it's full but the fuel would tank would be empty so nobody will take it right okay now the point is that we are all inside a car already we are all on a journey already whether we like it or not we are on a journey and there is a machine that we are uh, we have entered into but we know very little about it so very very logically if you are an intelligent person then what do you do when you when you find yourself in such a situation what would one do start knowing more about it all right so what are the different things that one would know about now that i've given you the analogy and i've showed you what we are talking about so it's the it's life it's the human body we are inside this machine there are different parts to the machine there is a driver in this machine so what is what are how would you go about it mechanisms and engines who what would be the most important part in a vehicle that you enter control steering yeah so yeah so you might have a very good looking car uh, full of petrol uh, what about driver yes brilliant so the getting stock getting an, an understanding of the driver is critical first and foremost because whatever the thing is if the the car is in the right hand then you can be sure that your journey will be safely conducted or you can then negotiate with the driver to take you to the right destination so getting a good understanding about the driver is key right um so now let's go step by step so first and foremost let's start from that which is really visible so there is a body right so i mean the machine now th there are two ideas there one is it is important to understand what is the nature and capacity of the machine one of the things that our indian uh, forefathers did what our what our bharatiya uh, ancestors did is that they recognized very early on that there are appearances and there are facts and if you get that wrong there will be certain challenges that will come up so yesterday's game of uh, the snakes and ropes was really in my understanding as a psychologist is the fact that it's very important to get our perceptions of life straight if you mistaken a snake for a rope and a rope for a snake the consequences can lead to suffering and if it's serious enough to death so right at the start one has to establish what is the nature of the perception we have why because there is a journey that is going on we are all on a journey whether we like it or not this journey apparently has a start and apparently has an end so how do you go through this journey in a manner that you will make the most of it because if you don't uh, make the most of it time is wasted investments are wasted every moment is an investment so what are we doing about the investments and where are we headed right so one needs to understand all the, have a good grasp of all of that otherwise the uh, the way in which this journey is undertaken is problematic for oneself so and the journey is a sum total of the different kinds of decisions we are making those decisions are based on facts or are based on certain premises if that premise is faulty then the decisions that one will make will be challenging if the decisions that you are making will be challenging then it will necessarily lead to some form of disaster or the other so our ancestors early on said okay what i see is not necessarily what is is there a possibility of knowing things as such because if i can look at something and know thing as such then i will ensure that whatever i'm whatever decision i'm making is more logical is more reasonable and therefore i'm on a safer side so they decided that one has to get one's perception right now when we're talking about the machine itself coming back to that story many of us might look at this machine and some of us have different impressions about it so one might think that it's an auto okay what is the other really expensive kind of a car that one might think of what is it anybody rolls royce 
Okay, then you start understanding a few things here. You start understanding a few things. One is that there is a machine, it has a certain function. Huh? And so if an auto is there, you can have a Rolls Royce or a Benz. But if you want to go into the gullies of Varanasi, I can assure you that they are not the easiest vehicles to steer. So there is this concept of a Desha Kala Patra type. So there is the concept of the rightness of things. The more we understand that there is a right thing, a right place, a right way to do it, the more that intelligence grows in us, the more we are able to steer whatever we have in a more sensible manner. So there is first and foremost a machine, an understanding of the machine. So what, what really are we? Supposing we start off thinking that, okay, looking at my system, I think it functions like an auto. The question is, is it absolutely an auto? Is it bound to remain what it is? Or can it become something else? So this was a, a, a question that intrigued our ancestors. Really this question that we are arriving at is, who really am I? Because it was all about potentials. If I understand what my potential is, net potential. So I'd like to place that at one of the key words. I decided to do this the classical style, the teacher with the board and the pen. <laughs> so uh, they decided to look at what is the net potential of the individual. There is an apparent potential and there is a net potential. So how do we understand what is this net potential and how does understanding that help us deal with the different experiences we have in a more effective manner? Okay, so I have this favorite exercise that I do. I, I'd like you to look at your hand and tell me what you see. Lines. What else? What else are you seeing? Fingers, skin, yes. What else? Right, okay. What else? Color, excellent. Potential, excellent. So you see already you're looking at a physical thing, but you're understanding what it is capable of. And in that context, I'll just very quickly tell you this verse, which is the uh, the one that we're supposed to say every morning, no? So, Karagre Vasate Lakshmi Karamadhyay Saraswati Kalamule Cha Govinda Prabhate Kara Darshanam. Those who say that, you know, Indian gods and goddesses are those idols are in a way, they've completely missed the point because if I'm saying Karagre, Vasate, Lakshmi, I don't have that idol sitting, you know, I don't have like that figure sitting there. One automatically understands that it is symbolic. And that's the other thing I was telling about. It's symbolic of Karagre, Vasate, Lakshmi of wealth. So again, it makes you start thinking, what does it mean to say, I have wealth at the tip of my fingers? And then Karamadhye Saraswati, so knowledge. So I've got knowledge in the middle of my palm. And that's the main part of it. That's the real, that's what, where we hold things. So that has to be the foundation. And then with that, this is the more uh, agile part of it. You can then get wealth if you have a strong foundation. Karamule cha Govindha. So I was thinking of this. What is, how does Govinda fit into this? Govinda, very terminologically, etymology of the terminology itself is fantastic. Because it's a go. Go can mean many things, cow, etc., etc. But go also can mean light because it comes from the root gu, ray of light. So go in the Vedas, Sri Aurobindo says, is symbolic of ray of light and spiritual illuminations. So when the rishis are saying we're looking for the cows, we're looking to increase cows, they're actually seeking to increase their spiritual illuminations. So go win the one who goes in search of this and gets it also. Also one who's in quest of the light, that's what it basically means. But in my uh, understanding of the personality of Govinda, uh, it was very interesting to discover a, an important law of physics. So when uh, Govinda, when he held the Govardhana Parvata, which law of physics was he actually applying? Center of gravity. So the fact is that if you, if you, even if you have a very, very heavy thing, but you get the right center of gravity, you will be able to hold it up and balance it. Okay. Now, while it is again a very material uh, law at work, we also see that it has a psychological application. So no matter how big a problem that we have in life, you find the right center of gravity in that and one can handle it. Okay, so it's really about finding that right thing. So this concept of the right plays a very important role and we'll come to that as well. So we had that. So Karagre, so Karamule uh, Govindaha and every morning Prabhate Darshanam. So you look at the hand and you energize and you remind yourself that if you if you do this, I can assure you that you'll never be a depressed person. I can assure you that if our youth every morning got up and looked at their own hands, 
uh, and you know, engage with karma yoga, they'd never be depressed because they knew that everything is in their hands. It's a matter of how you're doing it, what you're doing about it. Okay, so uh, this this was just one other shloka here. So when we're talking of perceptions here, again, going back to the thing of who really are we? And when we look at the hand here, you look at it as uh, potential as well. So there is a material reality to this. There's a potential reality to this. Fine, next. Supposing you have, uh, and when you look at your hand like this, it makes sense to maybe wear rings, maybe put mehendi, it makes sense. Supposing circumstantially your lens is changed and you have an x-ray lens on, that's just a lens, what would you see? Bones, right? If you only had an x-ray lens in your life, God forbid it ever happens, supposing you get stuck with one, uh, would you put mehendi? If you were looking at human beings through that, what would happen to life? <laughs> so you would have an immediate vairagya, right? Because all this, and then you start realizing how deep is beauty, physical beauty. I mean, it doesn't take, you know, it's not rocket science to figure that out, right? It just needs a change of lens to figure out where things, perspectives are. Supposing you, at, at that level, if you have to lift a heavy thing, would you lift it the same way like you go and lift it now? No. Why? Because you can see that what it's doing to your bones. You lift up anything, you can exactly say all that pressure and then you're like, oh my God, you'll do it very differently. Right? Now, supposing you had a... Uh, um, uh, this one, uh, no, no, infrared lens. You wore an infrared lens. What would you see? Now, with the core, you'd see heat waves. So you'll see color. You'll see all sorts of colors. Now, when you were looking, when you look at it, you see it's like fixed forms, right? Next, when you look at it as an x ray thing, already you see that there is a layering that is happening. Uh, there is a bone and there is a thinner thing around it. It's not so concrete as you think the skin is, right? When you looking at it through an X-ray lens, uh, through an infrared lens, it's even more blurred. It's all heat waves. It's like psh, suddenly this beautiful, elegant finger of mine starts looking like, oh my God! It's like there's much more happening around the finger. Okay, now supposing. So what have we done here? Basically, you are looking at the same hand. We've not changed objects. You're looking at the same object. The lens you are using to look at it. What has that done? It's changed our perception of that same reality, and as a result, what? Our response to that. Okay, now supposing you have a, a very powerful lens, you're looking at your hand through a very powerful micro, uh, you know, biological lens. What will you see? Molecules and all, even more powerful. Atoms, it goes on. So, quantum lens, what were you likely to be looking at? Electrons, photons. Will you see your hand at all? Okay, so I'll take you through this exercise. I'd like you to close your eyes. I'd like you all to close your eyes. Because finally they say that, you know, Anubhava itself is the, the greatest teacher. So I'd like you all to close your eyes. And I'd like you to visualize yourself looking at your hand through this quantum lens. Do you see your hand? Are you seeing your hand then? Uh, I'd like you to apply that lens to the rest of your body. Can you, if you ask yourself the question, who am I? What do you see? Just hold the, hold the answers in your mind now. I'll just take you through this little journey of mine. So as you apply that lens on yourself and you're looking at, keep your eyes closed and keep doing this exercise because I'll, there will be two, three layers. So I'd like you to apply this quantum lens on yourself and try and understand where is the boundary between you and your chair. Where really do you stop and your neighbor begin? What is the experience of being in this space and in the space around it? Does it make sense to say I'm in the Chinmaya Vishwavidya Peter campus? In this experience of a quantum world, I'll ask you to use the lens of gender. So imagine you're looking at a woman. I mean, use the gender lens. Does it make any sense? Use the age lens, nationality lens, religious lens. 
at that stage if you ask yourself the question who am i what really do you feel i'd like you also to enter into this experience try and as concretely describe your experience in that condition when you use that lens to look at yourself and the world around you how would you describe your experience what can you say about the physicality of your being what emotion do you feel what what mental level do you experience do you have cognition there and if indeed this universe is made of energy and vibration as tesla says he says if you want to know the secrets of the universe think in terms of energy vibration and frequencies so at that level while there is movement what is the backdrop of that movement there is movement there is a backdrop of that movement and every day when you're having a meal we chant this mantra brahmarpanam brahmahavihi so there is this word brahman that we talk about which comes from the root br which means infinite expansion so when you say brahmarpanam the offering is to brahman brahma brahmarpanam brahmahavihi the what you are offering is also expansion Brahma Gnau, the fire to which you offer is also expansion. Brahmana Hutam, it's that expansiveness that is offering it. Brahmai Vate Nagantavyam, through that process you have to reach that. And Brahma Karma Samadhina, one does that act in that experience. Is there anything else than that when you use the quantum lens in a sense? and is that state of being a dead experience or is it a living conscious experience so i'd like you to note what is your emotional experience there what do you feel under that in that state of expansiveness unconditioned expansiveness possibly and then i'd like us to gradually come back to this but keep your eyes closed i'd like you to zoom back so out of the quantum state into the biological state and i'd like you to notice at what point do the boundaries of you start becoming you and then also think of this mantra that we that is a very powerful one which is so hum i am that what does that really mean and then i'd like you to reconnect to your physical self again zoom back into your cells and all and then i'd like you to hold your hand in front of you as you open your eyes and you look at your hand and you open your eyes <laughs> and i'd like you to maybe one or two of you if you'd like to just share what was the what exactly did you go through right now what was this all about it was an exercise but what was it really about <laughs> understanding a driver yes jivatma yes you felt like a distant observer detached observer so we start understanding what this the sankhya uh, yoga philosophy is talking about in the sankhya philosophy that there is a purusha but then it also gets into this prakriti business that there is this purusha and prakriti duality so there is that so you get a understanding of what was there only one purusha then you are thinking there is one but there are so many everybody is thinking one 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 so multiple in that context okay huh? so we had an expert but what was this really all about when we talk of net potential and potentials what is it really in in that context 
that what we have gone through is understanding the range or the spectrum of possibilities of the human being. So each one is a certain layer. Huh? So when you're in the physical body, the, uh, this was uh, very beautifully brought out to me by uh, Vaidya Dev Pujari ji, who's the chairman of the NCISM Ayurveda and Ayush. So he was telling me that Ayurveda is essentially a very mathematical science. I said, what do you mean by that? So he says that when we look at the other end of the spectrum, so we've looked at this end where the Purusha, so we see it's spirit, it's like energy and all that. But we cannot deny the fact that we are in this body. This body is a very functional reality. What is this body really made of from a very bottom up perspective? That is top down perspective. Bottom up perspective, what is this body really made of? What are, what are the composites of this body? Composition. Carbon. <coughs> Yeah, but in a more grosser form, it comes together for the Panchabhutas. So this body is made of the Panchabhuta, the five elements. Now, the permutation, each of those five elements has a characteristic at a physiological level, emotional level, mental level, it has characteristics. This was also talked actually first, Ayurveda psychology was introduced to me by uh, Dr. Mala Kapadiyaji. Very interesting way of looking at it. So she said, if the body is made of these uh, elements, then compositions of that will create different physical types, different emotional types. If somebody is more Vayu person or Vata person, that person will have a certain psychological type also, naturally, will have a certain mental type, will also have a certain physiological type. If somebody is more uh, Kapha type, which is a combination of the Mahabhutas, then they will have a certain physical composition, a certain emotional composition, a certain mental composition. Next, so it's all about ratios. Uh, combinations, permutation and combination and ratios. Next, he says, he says the food that you eat, also Panchabhuta. So if I'm a very Vata type and I'm eating Vata food, I can only expect more Vata and exaggerated Vata causes imbalance and therefore I will suffer from certain diseases at emotional and mental levels because there's an exaggeration. So then he says that the place you are in has its own uh, Panchabhuta, uh, you know, uh, expressions. The time of the day has its own thing. So the food, the time, the structure, all of this is nothing but permutation and combinations of uh, Panchabhutas. As a result, you can have predictions. If this, 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 add this, 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 then there will be this, this, this disease. And you can therefore predict. So in some of these Ayurveda texts, they have something like 3 lakh diseases that they've anticipated, just based on the permutation and combinations of the Panchabhutas. I mean, what Mahadevan ji was just trying to, uh, you know, elicit our uh, curiosity about was the need to explore the detail with which the civilization has been uh, worked out. For 2000 years, we were 24% of the world's GDP minimum. For a civilization to have such sustained prosperity cannot happen in thin air. It had to go through uh, very detailed systems of knowledge, interdependent systems of knowledge. Only then it could have survived. Which of course, when the when my colleague came, he falsified everything, and therefore we were suddenly blocked. And then now, when you have to look for knowledge, where do you do? They say we are white man's burden. We will enlighten you. They had that problem because it, it's difficult to acknowledge that somebody else has truth when you claim the only truth. So, but these were certain challenges that are there. But anyway, so the long and short of it is that our ancestors they recognized very early the rishis uh, because they were seers. They saw very early that we are functioning on false perceptions. Is there a way of rectifying those perceptions? Those false perceptions are about who I think I am. If I think I am only my hand, I will behave in a particular way. If I think that I am Brahman consciousness, I will behave in a very different way. If I think that they are two separate things completely, I will again behave in a different way. And if I know that this hand has, has Brahman also in it, my body will behave in a different way. So there were multiple permutations and combinations again possible depending on where I plug my identity. So when they talked of net potential, because if you're faced with any problem, unless you know what that potential of that uh, thing is, of the resource that is dealing with the issue, the manner in which you will deal with it is very different. If I think that I'm only a 100 meter runner versus I know that I'm a marathon runner, I will run the races in very different ways. You see, and then if I am smart enough, I will be able to calibrate my run. So what the ancients did is that they knew that I can be an auto when I need to be an auto. I will be a cycle when I need to be a cycle. 
but i can also be a rolls royce if i have to be a other whatever you know another i've just talked of cars i can be a plane i can be anything if it is required but for that one had to have that vivek buddhi of what is what where is what and that's the reason why one of the okay i will uh, this is where i'll get the boat that is the other thing so supposing you have three kinds of waters uh, you've got gutter water sea water and rose water supposing one was only limited to these three kinds of waters what would happen how would one behave with them will you treat them all the same way we don't treat them the same way right because they have different apparent properties but if somebody is an intelligent person if somebody says can you make give me some drinking water of them is that possible it's possible for that you have to have the next level of knowledge about it so you need to have knowledge you need to have knowledge k okay, that yes this is water is not only this there is something more to them if i have the technique so knowledge plus technique allows me to take something to the next level huh? by certain distillation processes filtration processes i can allow to the next level which is about maybe drinking water and this has three states so it has a, a physical state it has a liquid state and it has a vapor state again so what level are we working on next is this the end of it is this the end of the story what happens next is this the end of water can you push it further what happens energy so you come up further even before it comes to energy we know that this is actually h2o we understand the composition but for that again you need to have not and you have to dig further so one of the things that they have found that makes successful people is this ability of a first principle thinking and that's another feature of the upanishads they never stopped at easy assumptive answers they would always ask what next is that really it is that really it is that really it how um, our uh, brigu arrived at the panchat panchakosha was because his father said no think a little more about it think a little more about it think a little more about it and he went to subtle and subtle levels of himself so you come to h2o is that the end of the story what next you can get it into hydrogen and oxygen right is that the end of it no what do you see energy <laughs> okay so we see that and all of this how does it happen with some knowledge and technique it's not simple you have to have knowledge you have to have technique but now at what stage does it start becoming water only when it combines into this right otherwise it's independent now we we started off with gutter water let's say but what is it capable of being at the end at what level can you bring in fundamental change if you want to make something completely not it at what level can you do that it's only at that level at that level what do you do what can what else can water become like really or an extreme you can even make a hydrogen bomb let's say so something i mean this is all theoretical and i'm not i'm not the most equipped person to talk about it but just with a very minimum knowledge also you can arrive at this thing that even if you have got a water but if you know how to go to fundamentals you will create great change so absolute change can happen at an absolute level the more fundamental the knowledge about things the more absolute the transformation if you want to talk about transformation it would only happen at a subtle level as a result when they talked of transformation of the being it did not just happen at a cosmetic level one had to undertake the process of self knowledge the more one understood the essence of what is this what is this machine that i'm working with what is it what are its what are its fuels we can talk of it at a very simple level also if it is a machine it needs to have maintenance it needs to have exercise if you don't use it it will get rusted uh, that's why you need to do color in the morning for example <laughs> so you need to eat the right food otherwise if you are giving in the wrong fuel it will have its own consequences you see we can't keep putting in nonsensical fuel and think the gadi is going to run for long common sense again none of this is rocket science it's just very very practical step by step understanding if one has all right then like i said the driver understanding who really is driving are my emotions driving me and we will have the snake and rope story depending on who's driving me i will end up in that square i can i can have all the experiences of life or i cannot have anything but if i have ahankara 
so uh, i will end up so yeah, i was we was i was talking to sahana ji uh, yesterday and there was this i think it was with you only about this narrative of the uh, you know people are reading uh, amish's books and all and there is this glorification of ravana so there is at some point a, a friend of mine wrote on a post he said on facebook he said that uh, you know we should stop this public lynching of ravana uh, that we are doing every year and all so i said you know this is what happens that the unfortunate reality with the modern world is that it functions only on rationality and in this civilization rationality was put at its right place very very early on we realize that there is much more to life than rationality why because rationality functions on a limited data set of experiences if you have a limited data set of experience you can make good arguments if somebody shows you a better adds a new set of information to you you can maybe argue better but reality and knowledge was not only dependent on that that we had to be there was a faculty of knowing things at a higher level um i will just say how much time i should stop maybe in 5 minutes or something how much time do i have 5 huh? i'll close okay so just to uh, wrap the story around again and to come to a close here uh when we talk of understanding of life we see that the universe out there functions at a much more in a much more systematic manner than the human mind could have ever made it happen so the question is that is knowledge what i create with my head or is really knowledge out there big question and one of the things that we realize is that as we build our faculties and all you realize that actually there is a lot of knowledge out there and i can access that knowledge through different channels the the more i recognize that the data set through which i function is limited first of all all my thinking so what murti ji was saying also he referred to the word drishti our normal functioning happens on our thinking chintana huh? so chintana is happening on the limited data set and therefore whatever you produce from there will be of a limited partial view the question is can one have a more integral view of things and there the idea is that the more one recognizes that there is wisdom out there and the more i am able to open up to that i will know things how did ramanujan know all his uh, equations and all he was receiving knowledge because knowledge is out there so the bharatiya mind which is a very special quality of mind which we have unfortunately uh, you know lost today we what we are trying to retrieve is not only sorry not only these knowledge uh things not only information about how much how many you know maybe iron pillars or not that 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 is important but what is also more important from a renaissance perspective is to recover the bharatiya mana the bharatiya chitta getting that back is i think one of the most important tasks at hand what does that mean is again a question but the bharatiya mind basically we have two options for knowledge if i think that the knowledge i have <coughs> is what is in my head so my instrumentation plus the instruments that i'm using that's what science does it uses instruments because what science uh, the, the, the instrument has a certain a spectrum of access tomorrow if that instrument becomes more sophisticated i know more about it so it's not that i'm creating knowledge i'm discovering existing knowledge with the greater degree of sophisticated instrumentation i have and my instrument is also there the human instrument i can have the most sophisticated instrument but if my I, i don't have the faculties i will completely miss seeing what is there so two levels of instrumentation so what they realize first and foremost the importance of clarifying clarifying my own system and the more i'm able to do that the more i will have access directly to knowledge rather than through instruments was a possibility so drishti of things was a possibility beyond chintana but that can only happen when there is a silencing of the human instrumentality and what does that mean and this with this i will close so if you look at the human system if you look at the human system let's say you've got this is another favorite of mine so a b c you've got three systems and we are vibratory beings at the end of the day so you have one kind of a vibratory system that is okay so this is also a bit of the panchakosha thing at the physical level it's all like that mental emotional mental and then uh, vijnana and then ananda okay i should make that clear and they're all interconnected versus a second system which is a little okay and a third one which goes physical level emotional level mental level 
Okay. Does this correspond to anything you know already? If somebody has a vibratory structure which is like this, what kind of a person would that person be? Huh? So this is what is the tamoguna thing. The system is all dark. What kind of breathing will that person have? What kind of breathing? Short. What kind of mental clarity? What kind of dependency with the world around them? They will be, you'll have to ask always, if somebody says this, then you'll, ah, okay, 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 like that, right? Second person. Huh. Okay. So you see that there is dynamism and all. And in which of these systems will you have greatest clarity? Right. So we see that the greatest clarity is if you have that. So the purpose was how do we go from being a noisy system to a quiet system? Because the more one does that, the more efficiency one increases. The more one is able to identify what is the ritha. And the last, 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 what I will tell and close is this last concept, which is again a favorite, is this idea of the um, satyam, ritam, and brihat. So when one could be fully present in oneself, which is the etymology of the word satya. Satya means being in the present. Sat, being. Beingness is what satya is all about. So when one could be fully in that, then one knew what the right thing is. Until then, one is functioning on this data set, which is backdated. Which, so if one has the ability of being fully present, then one has the ability of knowing the right thing, the ritter to be done. And if we could do that, then the results would necessarily be brihat. So if you have a musical note that goes like that, you play it exactly like that, what will happen? You get a resonance. So this satyam, ritam, brihat idea of the civilization was about knowing what are the ideals, what is the best potential of this nation. Follow that in application, execution, which is ritam. The result would naturally be brihat. You don't have to worry about great things. Worry about that satya, finding out what is the ideal, and then finding the best ways of reducing the gap between what one sees and what one executes. The more effectively one is able to do that, the rest is automatic. The consequence, brihat. And that was the sum total of the idea of the dharma. Because when one is able to do that, then the best is upheld. So dharma, so at the end, just to close with the, the shloka of the Gita, no? Sorry, I don't know it by heart. Where he says, <coughs> at the end of the Gita, he says, Iti te jnanam akhyatam guhyat guhyataram idam maya vimrishyetad asheshena yathe chasi tathakuru. So I've, in the, at the end of the 700 shlokas of the Gita, he says this. He says, I've told you, and this is the secret of the secrets. Now you do what you want with it. And one person very interestingly pointed out that the entire, the summary of the Gita is in the first two words. It says, Dharma Kshetre Kuru Kshetre. And he says, you uh, reshuffle the order of those words and it becomes Kshetre Kshetre Dharma Kuru. So in every field, dharma, not as in religion and all, but in the context that I've said, in every field, discover what is the ideal, what is the best, what is your highest potential, what is the highest potential of that thing. Then with that precision, apply. And when that application will happen, you cannot but do the best. So if this civilization was at its height, it was because it aspired for best and was not in this mediocrity that we've become so content with. So the Indian mind today is content with mediocrities, kam chalao. So a sincere appeal that get this mind out of mediocrity and quest for the best, the best quality in everything, the best potential of everything. And then you will see what difference it makes to life. Bahu dhanyavada. So, Mahodaya, for a very interactive session. Bhavatya Guhyatamam Gyanam Bahu Nutana Taya Pratipaditam. Chemistry, Maths, Adi Mishrit Madhyam in Sarva Muktam. We are very grateful for such creative and beautiful session. Once again, thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now, I humbly request Mahadevan sir to please come on this stage once again. And I request our Vice Chancellor Ajay Kapoorji to please felicitate our today's speakers who have blow uh, who uh, for the speakers for blowing our minds with their thoughts on IKS. Thank you so much.
a big hand for mahadevan sir I thank our both uh, both these speakers once again. Now we have 15 minutes break. We can come back to this hall by 11 because there will be panel discussion by our guest speakers and the scholars today. So yeah, Shrinath sir will be instructing. I'm sorry, <laughs> I was not meant to break her. Uh, I just wanted to add when she complete that uh, it is a 15 minutes break. But then if you can be a little earlier, we can start at the earliest. um there will be a, a very interesting video a 5 minute video that we are going to play before we start the panel discussion so please have your tea fast and please come back fast uh, the tea is at anakshetra sifa nakshetra where we have